So with this lecture, we're moving to the final section of the class, the section that looks at the post-Roman world and the Middle Ages. And the texts we'll look at come from both the eastern and western parts of the Mediterranean world. And this has, of course, been the pattern for the entire course, but at this point, the significance has changed. And this is because, beginning in the 5th century AD, the fates of the eastern and western sections of the Roman Empire permanently diverge. And this is, of course, because the fall of the Western Empire occurs in the 5th century, but a continuation of the empire in the East stretches all the way until the 15th century. So what I want to do in this lecture is try to explain how it happened that this empire divided, how what the Western half of it succumbed to invasions by non-Romans, and how the East managed to survive. Um, next time we're going to talk about how biographies uh, written about figures who are instrumental in both of those transformations uh, are composed and what sorts of things they do. And the texts are particularly interesting because they emphasize how different these rulers were from the Romans who came before them and the barbarians with whom they fought. But they make their case using structures, strategies, and stories that are lifted straight out of Roman predecessors like Eusebius and Suetonius. And so this shows how complicated it was for people in the post-Roman West to deal with the powerful literary legacy of the Roman Empire. And next week, of course, we will talk about the East and how the East continues to engage directly with this Roman legacy that it never lost. But in the West, um, it's important to understand how it is that the Roman past becomes the past. And so to do this, we need to think about and, and talk a bit about what the loss of the West was, why the Roman control of the West stops, and what it means for the people living in that area. So to start with, it's important to emphasize that the loss of the West by the Roman Empire was by no means inevitable and was absolutely shocking to the people who lived through it. So in the year 400, Roman controlled Spain for 600 years, Gaul for 450, and Britain for almost 350 years. So by contrast, the United States has controlled California for 170 years, and that seems like permanence. Um, Roman control of this territory extended far longer than the history of the entire United States. But once Roman control began to be threatened, Roman control of the West receded relatively quickly. So in 400, it controlled all of that territory in the West. In 500, it controlled none of it. And so this is what the world looked like in 500. Um, and all of that wonderful Roman salmon has disappeared. Now, to understand this process, we need to step back to a series of events that occurred in the 370s. The nature of the Roman frontier began to change in the 360s and 370s because of the growing power of the Huns in what is now the Ukraine. And the expansion of the Huns pushed the Goths, a people living along the Roman border um, in the Ukraine, Moldova, and Romania, into Roman territory. So in 376, the Roman government made an agreement to allow Gothic refugees to cross the Danube frontier and settle in Roman territory south of the river. Now, this was a good idea for the Romans because the area south of the Danube was underpopulated, and if the plan worked, it would provide Rome with increased tax revenue, um, land that had become forested would again go under cultivation, and the empire could also recruit some of the people who were raised on that land for military service. And Rome had done this many times in the past. Uh, this wasn't a new way of dealing with refugee populations that wanted entrance into Roman territory, but this time the settlement plan didn't work because the Goths who crossed crossed in far greater numbers than the Romans expected. And the agreement was supposed to designate a few crossing points where the Goths would come across and be directed to territory in, in um, Roman territory that they could begin farming on. The problem was uh, that Goths crossed in far larger numbers and they didn't cross in these selected points. Um, and so what this meant was there was not enough food for the Goths in the places where they settled. Um, and there were far more Goths than the Romans expected. And so in 377, the Goths, feeling like the Romans had behaved treacherously, revolted. And in 378, the Emperor Valens mobilized an army large enough uh, and prepared to attack forces of the Goths. 
And he came upon the Goths outside of the city of Adrianople, a city that's right now on the border, more or less, where Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey meet. And outside of Adrianople, um, the Goths not only defeated Valens, but they killed Valens and destroyed much of his army. And from this point forward, Goths would never again leave what had been Roman territory. For most of the next 40 years, Goths and Romans would engage in on-again, off-again battles, with the Goths sometimes agreeing to live peacefully in Roman territory, before taking up arms against Rome when they got angry or they felt like the Romans had betrayed them again. And the Gothic problem was compounded in 406 by a natural event. On New Year's Eve of 406, the Rhine River, the frontier that separated barbarians in Germany from the Roman Empire, froze solid. And large groups of barbarians, with the fierce vandals among them, crossed into Roman territory. And this occurred at the same time that a Gothic general named Alaric had rebelled against Rome. So Rome, before the barbarian crossings, had reached a tentative agreement with Alaric uh, to try to provide him with some support and settle him in Roman territory. But the Roman commander who was making the agreement failed to show up with Alaric when Alaric expected him to do so and uh, Alaric rebelled. And the problem that the Romans had was they were now dealing with these barbarians who had crossed into Roman territory while Alaric felt double-crossed. And so there were two major threats from barbarians occurring at the same time. But Alaric's threat was in some ways more immediate because Alaric marched into Italy uh, and made it clear that if he wasn't paid off, he would attack the city of Rome. And he demanded 4,000 pounds of gold to call off the attack, and the Roman commander at the time got the Roman nobility to, to provide much of the money. But that commander was killed before the money was delivered, and in 408, Alaric then moved into Italy and started uh, his attacks on Roman territory in Italy. In the summer of 408, he puts Rome under siege. Now again, this is for Alaric a negotiating tactic. And um, there was an agreement made with Alaric, but again, the Romans didn't follow through. So again, in the summer of 409, Alaric puts Rome under siege. Again, there's an agreement, but the Romans don't follow through. And so in 410, Alaric marches on Rome for a third time. And in 410, he does not spare the city. Instead, his troops spend three days pillaging Rome. And the sack of Rome by the Goths is the first step in the political disintegration of the Western Empire. But even more significant is the settlement of the Goths in the Roman province of Aquitaine in 418. The Goths are allowed to occupy this Roman province, be governed by their own rulers, and live under their own laws. And in return, they're supposed to provide military service to the Romans and attack the Vandals in Spain. Now, the Vandals, following the attacks of Goths against them in Spain, cross into North Africa, fleeing the Goths. Um, and so the Goths get their independence, but the Vandals are not destroyed. Uh, and instead, when they get into North Africa, they begin taking Roman territory in North Africa. So for most of the 420s and early 430s, they move through Roman territory in North Africa, capturing more and more territory. Um, until in 439, they capture the capital of the province, the city of Carthage, and they have now created an independent North African state. And interestingly, St. Augustine dies in the city of Hippo as the Vandals are besieging the city. And so Augustine really bridges this great sort of 4th century inclusive Roman Empire and the beginnings of the 5th century fall of the Western Roman Empire. But the Vandal settlement in North Africa is recognized by the Roman government in 442 as an independent state. And so unlike the Goths in Aquitaine, the Vandals don't even have to serve as independent, Rom as independent Roman allies. They are completely independent. And this sets a new and alarming precedent. But the final straw in the Roman West came in Italy. Now, Roman authority held on in Italy. It was largely helped by its proximity to the east and the fact that Italy was a wealthy and urban province, and so there was enough resources for it to defend itself. But Roman power in Italy was becoming less and less something that was exercised by actual Romans. 
Instead, the army was increasingly in the hands of barbarian leaders, and these barbarian leaders would elevate and depose emperors as they wished. And so for much of the latter part of the 5th century, barbarian commanders would allow emperors to take power, manipulate them until they got tired of what the emperors were doing, and then they would um, overthrow that emperor and put someone else in charge. But for most of the 5th century, these barbarian commanders saw the value in having a Roman emperor, even if that emperor wasn't particularly powerful. But in 476, um, a general of mixed Hunnic descent named Odoacar decided to do away with Roman emperors, even ceremonial ones, altogether. And so Odoacar deposed this, this emperor, Romulus Augustulus, um, a child emperor whose father was, in effect, the power behind the throne. And Odoacar overthrew his father and then deposed Romulus Augustulus and uh, sent him away with a pension to a monastery where he lived out the rest of his life. Instead of putting someone else in charge, Odoacar simply took power himself. He didn't take the title of Roman Emperor. He didn't even take the title of King of Italy. Instead, what he did was he negotiated an agreement with the Eastern Roman Empire where he would serve as essentially the steward of the West um, under the nominal control of the East. But in practice, what Odoacar was doing was running his own Italian regime. And what we see is under Odoacar, Italy began to thrive. So Otto, Odoacar did things like renovate the Colosseum, pay for the rebuilding of the city of Rome. Uh, but the East was uncomfortable with this arrangement. And so in the early 490s, the East sent a Gothic general named Theodoric into Italy to try to do away with Odoacar. So we see here what Odoacar's kingdom looks like. Um, in the early 490s, uh, Theodoric goes into Italy, attacks the kingdom of Odoacar, and in 493, the war between Odoacar and Theodoric reaches a stalemate, and they agree to share power. But 10 days later, Theodoric, and there's Theodoric, uh, kills Odoacar at a dinner party. And so Theodoric now, after 493, is in charge of the Western Roman Empire by himself. Now, despite the brutality of killing Odoacar at a social event, Theodoric followed a policy of cooperation with the Romans who remains in Italy. And he also emphasized Roman continuity. So he governed using Roman law. Um, he worked with the Senate. He made sure that Roman officials continued. He made sure that the consulship uh, was still offered to Roman senators. And in 500, he visits Rome, he appears before the people as Roman emperors had done, and he addresses them in Latin to great acclaim. Now, Theodoric and his Goths clearly controlled matters, but for most of his reign, Theodoric worked quite closely with the Roman aristocracy. And so in light of this situation in the West, it's interesting to, to think about why is it that the East survived when the Western Roman Empire was so severely affected by these barbarian attacks? And part of the answer is the East had a number of advantages over the West. It was richer, and so it had more money to pay barbarians off. And it could also shift problematic barbarians to the West by paying them to go in that direction. But the East also had some other natural advantages. One advantage was the uh, great strength of the fortifications of its capital. And so um, this is the city of Constantinople, the Eastern capital. And what you see, of course, is quite obvious. The city of Constantinople is surrounded on three sides by water. Um, the side that wasn't surrounded by water was surrounded by this massive, massive fortification wall. And so tribes moving through the Balkans could attack the eastern parts of Europe that were controlled by the Eastern Empire. But the fortifications of Constantinople and the water that separated European Eastern Imperial possessions from Asian European or Asian Imperial possessions made it impossible for those barbarian tribes to really do much damage. And so they would basically wash up against the walls of Constantinople, realize they could not breach these massive fortifications, and um, then agree to be paid off to go to the West. As you get into the later 5th century, the Emperor Anastasius also built a series of walls across the Thracian Peninsula that prevented barbarians from even getting towards Constantinople. And so by the middle of the 6th century, um, the East 
had a strategy for dealing with barbarians that sent them to the West. But the East also had begun to look at the West and see that in the West, there was now more settled communities. Uh, the barbarians that had invaded had set up their own kingdoms. And so as you get into the later part of the 5th century, what you see is there are barbarian kingdoms that now are not just sort of random groups of warlords, but actually political structures that had begun to rule in their own capacity. And the uh, Emperor Justinian, who reigned from 527 until 565, decided that these barbarian kingdoms were unacceptable. Um, and what Justinian decided was that the Eastern Empire had the resources and it had the power to go back to the West and get rid of these successor barbarian kingdoms. And so in 533, the Emperor Justinian decided to mount an attack on the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa. And very quickly, he conquered this kingdom, and by 534, he easily completed the conquest of the Vandal Kingdom. In 536, he ordered his forces to then invade the Italian kingdom that had been set up by Theodoric, and now Theodoric's successors ruled this. Now, the eastern invasion of Italy took longer, um, but by the early 560s, the Italian peninsula was also under Roman control. And uh, in the early 550s, as the war in Italy raged, Justinian also decided to invade Spain. And so he took over part of the southern kingdom of the Visigoths. Now this is important because the four most powerful post-Roman states in the West were, in the, in the early 6th century, the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa, the Gothic Kingdom in Spain, Theodoric's Gothic Kingdom in Italy, and a fourth kingdom we haven't talked about at all, which was the Frankish kingdom in what's now France. Now, we haven't mentioned the Franks at all, but because of Justinian's campaign, the Franks are the only one of these big four post-Roman kingdoms in the West that are not eventually weakened or entirely destroyed by Justinian and the Eastern Empire's expansion back into the old Roman territories of the West. And so what this means is that the Franks will be at the center of what comes next in Western imperial history, in Western European history. Now, we haven't mentioned the Franks yet because the Franks are, uh, in a way, isolated from many of these other developments. Um, so this is the Emperor Justinian, and this is the the person credited with being the, the founding father, in a sense, of the Frankish kingdom. Now, the Franks originally lived in what's now Belgium and northwest Germany, and they had expanded into the northern parts of Gaul when the Romans there had been cut off from the imperial center in the later decades of the 5th century. But by the early 6th century, their king Clovis had begun to expand really aggressively into Gothic territories in Gaul. And he would eventually create a state that included basically all of the territory of modern France. And so this is an image of Clovis, and this is an image of the conquests of Clovis. And you can see how the conquests of Clovis um, re represent a major expansion of Frankish territory. So in the upper part of that map, you see that kind of brown color. That's in essence the beginning of the Frankish kingdom. Um, what Clovis is able to do during his 30-year reign is expand all the way down to include much of what's now modern France. Now, the dynasty that Clovis belonged to was called the Merovingian dynasty, and it was founded by his grandfather, and it lasted for over 240 years after Clovis's death. But Clovis, in a sense, represents the most accomplished of all of the Merovingian kings. And part of this is because Frankish hereditary law said that when kings died, their territory was divided. And after Clovis's death, his territory was divided between his sons, and then his grandsons um, further divided the territory. And the divided kingdoms fell into wars with each other. And after Clovis's death, it took nearly 100 years for someone to reunify this territory. But the Franks, in essence, were left to deal with this chaos on their own. The Romans never came back to Gaul, uh, and there were no states in the north or east who threatened the Franks. And so the Franks were in a nice little bubble. 
fighting amongst themselves, but not threatened from outside. And this is beneficial um, because the last decades of the 500s and the first decades of the 600s dramatically changed what the Mediterranean world would look like. The Eastern Roman Empire under Justinian had managed to fight effectively in the West only when it had peaceful relationships with the Persian Empire to its east. But to secure this peace and allow him to fight in the West, Justinian had agreed to a peace treaty that required him to pay large quantities of gold and silver to Persia, and when he died, his nephew, Justin II, immediately decided that he didn't want to continue to make these tribute payments. And then, perhaps not unrelatedly, he went crazy. Um, and neither one of those, as you can imagine, was good for the Roman state, because Justin's, Justin II's refusal to pay tribute triggered a Persian att attack in the later 560s, and with the exception of a period in the 590s, the war that that began lasted without resolution until the year 630, nearly 70 years. And it was this war that would lead to the end of the ancient world as we've known it. So after Justin's madness and the short, rather uneventful rule of his successor, a soldier named Maurice, um, took power over the empire. And this is Maurice. Now, in some ways, Maurice was a particularly effective emperor. Um, his goal as emperor was to stabilize the northern frontier, come to favorable terms with Persia, and then basically try to reestablish some sort of successful way of running the empire following the madness of Justin II. And he was helped in doing this by a revolt in the Persian court that happened in the 590s, um, where Maurice was able to restore the Persian king using Roman troops, and that put, a, um, that put Persia and Rome into a very good, strong, and genuine um, friendship that, it, that the two kingdoms or the two empires retained until in 602, a coup overthrew the emperor Maurice and led to his death. And that coup led to this emperor, the Emperor Phocas, taking power, but it also led to the Persian Empire attacking Rome out of a desire to inflict vengeance um, or to avenge the death of Maurice. And Phocas was remarkably incapable of dealing with this problem. Um, after eight years in which the empire was fighting wars both on its northern frontier and on its eastern frontier and not doing it very well, Phocas was overthrown and replaced by a young, vibrant emperor named Heraclius. Now, when Heraclius took power, the situation in the Roman world was dire. Persian armies were on the move, and Roman defenses in both the east and in the north were crumbling. And so in the east, uh, the Persians conquered Syria in 614, Egypt fell to them in 617. By 620, the Roman Empire effectively controlled only North Africa, a few parts of Italy, and the territory around Constantinople and a few coastal cities in Greece and Croatia. And then in 626, the Persian began moving for a final knockout blow by attacking the city of Constantinople. And if they'd managed to take the city, that would have been the end of the Roman Empire. And so sensing the inevitable, Maurice took the highest stakes military gamble tried by any Roman military commander in anyone's memory. He assembled most of the troops left in the Roman army and entrusting the defense of Constantinople against the Persians to the Christian bishop of the city and whatever troops were in the garrison of the city, he set out to invade Persia. Now, there was one established way into Persian territory, through Syria and down the Euphrates Valley, and this is where the Persian forces were concentrated. But what Maurice decided to do was to instead go through the mountains of Armenia. So this is what's left. Um, so he goes through the mountains of Armenia. And uh, while Persian troops are marshalling or are assembling to attack the city of Constantinople, Heraclius' troops start pressing down through northern Iraq and northern Iran. And eventually they capture the Persian capital of Ctesiphon, what's now basically a suburb of Baghdad. And they force the Persians to take or to return all of the land that they've taken from the Romans. And they inflict a, a really severe peace treaty on the Persians, so severe, in fact, that Persian, um, the Persian regime becomes completely destabilized. But unbeknownst to Heraclius, the Persians, or anyone else living in the ancient world at that time, 
a new force was rising up that would make all of this inevitable. Because in the 630s, as the Romans and Persians are dealing with the aftermath of this great 70-year-long war, a group of people in Arabia have organized the new religion. They were Muslims, um, inspired by the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. And Arab armies, Arab Muslim armies, um, in the early 630s, begin attacks along both their frontier, the desert frontier of the Roman Empire, and the desert frontier of the Persian Empire. They're armed with new military tactics and this new religion that had bound previously fractious Arab clans together, and they walk into a power vacuum that was left following the long and destructive Persian Wars. Both states had exhausted each other financially and militarily, and the Arabs, by contrast, are unified and energized. And so they sweep in quickly. And by the end of the, by the, end of the 630s, they had conquered all of the Persian Empire. Um, by 636, they had taken Rome and Syria. And by 642, they had taken uh, Egypt from the Romans. And the Arabs would keep pushing through Roman territory for the rest of the 7th century, finally wiping away Era, or Roman control of North Africa by the year 700. And then in 711, they cross into Spain and overwhelm the Visigothic kingdom there. And at this point, the Arabs had become the largest empire the world had ever known, larger than the Persian Empire, uh, larger even than the empire of Alexander the Great. And their attacks on the Romans were relentless. In 717, they even put Constantinople under siege for an entire year. The Romans really didn't recover their bearings until the early 730s, and they're not able to actually mount any serious counter-invasions against Arab forces until the 740s. So next week, we'll talk about what happens to the Romans once they recover their bearings. Um, and once they recover their bearings, they begin to do pretty well. The Arabs are never able to extinguish the Romans. But the Romans become a regional power now, not an international superpower. And what this means is that the northern Mediterranean has space for the first time in almost a thousand years for a power that is not Rome to emerge. And this is where the Franks come back into the picture. Under the successors of Clovis, the Franks had been a pretty big chaotic mess. They'd fought with each other, and over time the power of the dynasty of Clovis had been reduced. So by the end of the 7th century, the kings were mainly ceremonial figures. The real power in the state was held by people called the mayors of the palace. And so these are kind of like the stewards of Gondor in The Lord of the Rings. They are officially uh, delegated power by the kings. But royal power had become so weak that the mayors effectively run everything. And by 687, the mayors had, had basically taken over official power for themselves. And so they created a system where there's a ceremonial king in charge of all Frankish territory, but the actual control of the territory was divided among the mayors. And so this was a strategy for kind of reunifying the Frankish domains so that they could again work effectively as some sort of a central power. And this is important because um, the most powerful of these mayors of the palace was a man named Charles Martel, and he became involved in an event that would make the Frankish kingdom a European superpower. So in 732, uh, an Arab Muslim army crossed from Spain into Frankish territory. Now this is a, a force that, of course, uh, grew out of and was able to do this because of the Arab conquest of the Visigothic kingdom of Spain, the elimination of the last of the other post-Roman kingdoms in, um, in Europe after the uh, destruction of the Vandal Kingdom and the Italian Kingdom of Theodoric. Uh, and in 732, when this Arab Muslim army crosses into Frankish territory, its goal really is to see whether they could, um, to see what the Franks were made of and to see whether the Franks might, might fold in the face of an Arab attack in the same way that the Visigoths had. But Charles Martel meets these forces outside of the city of Tours. He beats them in, in a battle outside of the city of Tours, and then he pushes them back below the, the Pyrenees. Now, the Arab forces don't really come back. They were already overextended at this point. But the Franks had done something that the Visigoths, 
Um, and the Romans could not. They had defeated the Arabs. They had pushed them out of their, their territory. And this was completely different. Um, this was an assertion of Frankish power that meant something. It meant something very significant because it placed the Franks in a very positive um, comparison with what the Romans and other Christian kingdoms in Europe had been able to do. By 751, the son of Charles Martel, named, a man named Pepin the Short, had worked with and gotten the agreement from the popes to be crowned king in his own right. And when Pepin died in, seven, in 768, he was succeeded by Charlemagne, the great King Charlemagne. And uh, Charlemagne's brother, Carolman, got control of some Frankish territory as well. But Carolman died in 771, apparently of natural causes, just before a civil war with Charlemagne was going to break out. And in 771, Charlemagne took over as the, the dominant force over all Frankish territory. Now, Carol, uh, Carolman's widow had expected Carolman's son to take over Carolman's domain, uh, and when this didn't happen, she induced the Lombard kingdom in Italy to uh, declare war with Charlemagne, or declare war against Charlemagne, and Charlemagne, um, well, Charlemagne then invaded Italy. And by 774, Charlemagne had defeated the Lombards, absorbed their territory, and taken control of Italy as well. Now, Charlemagne would continue to expand his territory, uh, taking the fight to the Arabs in Spain, and then ultimately even to Mediterranean islands like Sardinia and Corsica. But what becomes clear is that by 800, Charlemagne and the Franks were doing things that even the Romans now could not do. And since the time of Justinian, the West had lived under the assumption that Roman power remained the most significant Christian power in the world. The empire had shrunk by a lot in the 7th century, but everybody still knew that uh, among Christian powers, the Roman Empire remained the most powerful one. But with Charlemagne, it was now clear that the non-Roman state of the Franks was more powerful in Europe than the Romans. The Franks, not the Romans, were able to work against the Lombards. The Franks, not the Romans, were able to beat back Muslim attacks from Spain and eventually even expand Christian territory in Spain um, by taking lands from the Arabs. And this is why on Christmas of 800, the Pope arranged to crown Charlemagne Roman Emperor. Now, the Pope's action in doing this is easy to understand. Because Rome was on the line between the Empire of Charlemagne, which looked new, powerful, and growing, and the old empire based in Constantinople that looked to be in decline. So if you look at this map, um, what you see is the uh, territory in Italy that Charlemagne controls goes just below Rome. It, it ends just below Rome. The rest of that territory in Italy, just below Rome, was still controlled by the Eastern Empire. And so the Pope has every incentive to try to build a relationship with Charlemagne. And when he crowns Charlemagne Roman Emperor on Christmas of 800, this, this offered the Pope an opportunity to shift his affiliation from an old, tottering empire to a young, rising one. But the only things that the Pope, the de facto person in charge of the city of Rome, had to offer Charlemagne was ceremonial. The Pope is the most prominent Christian bishop in the West, He's the person in charge of the city of Rome, and he's the person who could claim to represent the old traditions of the Christian Roman Empire. So what the Pope had to offer was the official recognition that Charlemagne's achievements had risen to the level of a Roman Empire emperor. And this might not seem like much, but to Franks and other people living in the post-Roman world, this recognition was huge. Because for 400 years since Gaul had fallen out of Roman control, the idea remained that Rome was the most important civilizing force in the, Rome, in the world. People remembered Rome. They remembered what it did. They remembered what it meant. They could walk through buildings that the Romans had constructed that no one in their world could, could match. Um, they could look at roads and networks and infrastructure and bridges and all sorts of things the Romans had built that they could not build themselves. The Romans were, in a sense, a ghost of uh, a, a wonderful, glorious past that had been lost. 
and when the Pope crowned Charlemagne Roman Emperor in Rome, it was the first time that one of these barbarian kings had fully and completely achieved a kind of parity with the Roman past. And so the desire to have a Frankish Christian king recognized in Roman terms is a fundamental part of the portraits of Clovis and Charlemagne that you read for this week. So in our next class, what we'll do is talk about how Einhard and Gregory of Tours draw upon the Roman biographical models that they inherited to make the case to their audience that Clovis and Charlemagne can be understood in some fashion using these Roman models of kingship and power. And what we'll see is a very deliberate attempt to use Roman literary models to explain the actions, achievements, and significances of Frankish kings, and then position them as influential figures in recognizable ways that gives them a kind of Roman veneer that's necessary to make them truly respectable in uh, any kind of comparison with the existing power that continues in Constantinople um, and continues to legitimately claim that Roman legacy.